Welcome everybody to today's edition of our webinar on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance. Uh, both speakers agreed to recording, so we will up, uh, record the lectures and upload them to the ICMRBS uh, YouTube channel. Uh, please remember to use the Q&A box for putting your question or raise your hand and then we can unmute you and you can directly forward or ask your question to the speaker. Uh, and I also remind you of the ICMRBS Early Career Researcher webinar, uh, which regularly takes place. So without further ado, then uh, we want to continue to the speakers. And our first speaker today is uh, Helen Mott from the University of Cambridge. And uh, so I will not introduce her, but actually Daniel Nittelsbach, a longtime colleague of her, will introduce Helen. And he, uh, because he also has some building uh, uh, people in the in the house, I guess. Uh, what, so it seems to be a general Cambridge problem. <laughs> uh, so he pre-recorded the uh, uh, the introduction, and I will try to play it. So please let me know if this works, and then I can. So. Hello, everyone. It is a great pleasure to introduce a long-standing colleague of mine, Dr. Helen Mott, as the first speaker of this week's ICMRBS webinar. Helen is from the University of Cambridge, where she has been a faculty member of the biochemistry department for just under 20 years. Helen did her PhD with Ian Campbell in Oxford, which was one of the early exciting places in the UK to study proteins by NMR. She then went to do a postdoc with Sharon Campbell at UNC in Chapel Hill, where she worked on deep proteins. Returning to the UK, she then came to Cambridge and worked initially with Ernest Lowy on the investigation of deep protein effector complexes before setting up her own group. Throughout her career, Helen has kept her focus on the exciting world of small G proteins, and she's truly an expert in all things concerned with deep protein related signaling. Today, she will tell us about some new and versatile tricks these molecular switches have up their sleeve. The title of her talk is Investigation of the Lipidated C Terminus of RAL A, Mutually Exclusive Binding to Membranes and Cal Modulin. With this, I would like to hand over to Helen. Stage is yours, Helen. Uh, okay, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to speak and, and thank you, Daniel, for uh, introducing me as well. So I'm going to tell you about our work on a very small piece of Raleigh, um, which is uh, actually just the hypervariable region at the C terminus. Um, and this work has already been done, uh, or most, most of what I'm going to show you really has been done by Sam Chamberlain, who's just finished his PhD in my lab. Okay, so our group in general work on small GTPAs is, um, as Daniel said, and these proteins are all uh, the same in that they bind to nucleotides, they bind to GDP or to GTP, and they switch between the two with the help of accessory proteins. So when they're inactive, they're bound to GDP. Um, in the presence of an exchange factor or a guanine nucleotide exchange factor, uh, they will be, um, the GDP comes off and then GTP combined. And then once they're in this GTP bound active form, they combine to downstream effector proteins. And then they get switched off again with the help of gaps, but I'm not really going to speak too much about those. Okay, so the kind of uh, uh, grandmother of G proteins, if you like, is RAS, which is the one that so many people have worked on. And that's mostly because of its importance in cancer. But we know a lot about the structures of these things because of the work on RAS. So the structures of the GDP and GTP bound forms are really very similar. And really the main differences between them are these two so-called switch regions. So we have switch one, uh, which I've covered in red and switch two, which is in cyan. And what happens is we have conformational changes depending on which nucleotide is bound. And that's really because of two hydrogen bonds which form between a threonine in switch one and a glycine in switch two and the gamma phosphate of the nucleotides. Those are what really drive these conformational changes. Um, and this note is just to make me remind you to, that when we talk about the GTP bound form of these proteins, we're always using analogs, which are non hydrolyzable because otherwise they just get hydrolyzed. So I, we often use GMPPNP, but that's really the active form. 
Now, what we know about these proteins actually uh, structurally has already been done with truncated proteins. So this is the G domain that I'm showing you here. But to crystallize these things, everybody cuts off the C terminus and that's because it's, uh, it's disordered. Okay, so we're working on a protein called RAL, which means RAS-like. So it is really very similar to RAS. Um, and if you can remember that last structure, it really is the same. It's the same kind of Rossman fold with um, beta strands surrounded by alpha helices. And this protein RAL, or, uh, which stands for RAS-like, has two isoforms, RAL-A and RAL-B. Um, so these are two crystal structures of two effector complexes of RAL-A. And then this is our NMR structure, which we published over 10 years ago. Um, of the complex of RAL-B with um, another effector called RLIP76. Now, what you can see here is that these RAL proteins basically look the same, even though we have two isoforms. And I guess the interesting thing is, why do we have two isoforms? And they actually select different effectors in vivo, and they have different um, effects in cancer cells as well. So there's some interest in why we have two of them, and that's one of the things we're interested in. So I said already that we always cut the C termini of these proteins off when we look at them. So um, if we look at these two proteins, um, then what we can see is they're basically almost identical. Um, and if we look at the bits that bind to the effectors, and that's the things that I've colored in orange here, they're basically 100% identical. So how do these two proteins have different effects? Well, obviously the C terminal halves of the proteins are a little bit different. And what I'm going to concentrate on here really is the C terminus, which is called, which is known as the hypervariable region. So this hypervariable region, um, it's not actually that variable, but it is the site of membrane attachment. So it has um, at the end a uh, cysteine, which is modified, and we'll go into that a bit more in the next slide. But this is where it's attached to membranes. And then also we have differential phosphorylation sites here. So this may be the origin of the difference between, between these two really very similar proteins. Okay, so um, as we said then, we have these two proteins which are very similar in this G domain, but we know that they're bound to membranes. And here is the hypervariable region, this little sequence from RAL A. Unfortunately, everybody's in my way. Oh, I can't even get rid of you. So I have this big... Uh, box from Zoom on my right hand side of my slides. I'll see if I can, hopefully I won't miss anything there. Okay, so we have this hypervariable region um, and this is gonna be um, uh, processed in the cell. And the processing goes that we have a uh, loss of the um, final three amino acids. And hopefully that's appearing on, your, on the right hand side of your screen because I can't see it. Um, and then we get carboxymethylation of the C terminus. Um, and then we get addition of geranol-geranol, uh, which is an isoprenol lipid. And that geranol-geranol then is enough to make it stick into the membrane. Okay, so this is what happens in the, in the cell. But this, uh, this whole motif is actually rather interesting because it doesn't just bind to membranes. So obviously it's polybasic. You can see all the uh, basic amino acids here. So these presumably help it to bind to membranes. Um, it's phosphorylated as well, so it has a, a serine here, which can be phosphorylated by aurora kinase. And the other interesting thing about it is that it, it's thought to be the site that binds to calmodulin in this protein. Okay, so what we wanted to do first of all was to look at uh, membrane interactions. So, the, so we actually did a method which um, has been around for a while. So uh, it was done originally with RAS binding to liposomes and then Mitsu Ikura did it with RAS as well, binding to nanodisc. So we just kind of followed the same path at the beginning of this work. So what you do is you use um, a very specific lipid. So this is based on phosphatidyl ethanolamine, but it has a malayamide group on the head. So you incorporate this into your nanodiscs and then engineer the protein so it only has one cysteine, which is the one of the final C terminus, and then you can very conveniently link this onto the nanodisks. Um, so we did this um, and we created nanodisks and we, um, we incorporated RAL under the conditions where we would, were expecting to get around two, now, two RAL proteins per nanodisk, so kind of one per face is what we were trying to aim for. You don't quite get that because actually when you make up your nanodisc like this, you can see uh, that we start off with, um, I don't know what this is, but I think it must be free nanodiscs uh, because I can't see it. <laughs> so we have uh, free nanodiscs and then we have RAL. And then when we add RAL, we can see that the, we actually end up seeing um, the 
the nanodisc RAL complex, and then we see free RAL because it doesn't all get incorporated. So this isn't completely efficient. Okay, so the spectra of the uh, nanodisc bound RAL look actually pretty good, uh, and we were able to assign them. Um, and that's, of course, because the RAL protein isn't embedded in the nanodisc, it's kind of waggling around on the surface. And what we wanted to do was to look at the beginning anyway, at chemical shift changes when we, um, when we added RAL onto the nanodiscs. So we looked at it in the two forms, the GMPPNP form and the GDP form, so active and inactive. And you can see that basically the HBR has disappeared, or, or at least, yeah, the HBR has completely disappeared. And then we see chemical shift changes in this region um, very close to it. And then we can see a few very small chemical shift changes throughout the protein. They're not very large. But what we did notice is that in the GDP form, they seem to be larger and more extensive than they were in the GMPPNP or the active form, giving us the idea that we had some nucleotide dependence on the way that it was interacting with the nanodisks. Uh, we were then went on to look at the intensity ratios because that's a, a good way to be able to look to see how intimately they're associating. And we saw the same, the same thing. So if we just looked, we have to normalize these, of course, because with the nanodisk, everything gets much uh, much weaker, but we normalized onto the end terminus, which we're pretty sure is very far away from the nanodisc. And what we could see then was in the GMPPNP form, overall the intensities were higher than they were in the GDP form. So we were clearly uh, seeing um, a more tight, a tighter interaction, if you like, of the GDP form, the inactive form with the nanodiscs. Okay, so we wanted to kind of um, do some modeling uh, on this. So what we did was we just used Haddock uh, so we created the nanodisc and we used our chemical shift mapping uh, to do some haddock docking. Uh, we had uh, the ideas already that um, if we added more negative phospholipids, we saw better interaction or tighter interactions of the protein. So we used um, phosphatidylserine as our active residues in haddock and, um, and PC, phosphatidylcholine as our passive residues. And then what we had to do was try to cluster them. So the problem with this docking is that um, RAL can dock all over the nanodisc. So the normal docking that you get, uh, sorry, the normal clustering you get out of Haddock doesn't really work. So what we did was we used this method, uh, which was published last year by a group who were doing very long simulations where they just defined two angles. So the tilt angle showing you how the protein uh, interacts in this direction, if you like, and then a rotation angle showing how it rotates with respect to the nanodisc. We use that to cluster our, um, our haddock models. So when we did this for our GDP bound RAL form, uh, we ended up with four clusters. We call them um, orientations one to four. So we clustered them and what we found was that in this major orientation, orientation one, um, that the RAL-A GDP, which is the inactive form, which needs to bind to a GEF protein, the GEF is unable to bind, so it's sterically uh, hindered from binding. And in fact, in all of these orientations, only one of them, orientation three here, was actually in a position where it could bind to a GEF protein. Okay, so that was what we got from the GDP form. Uh, we did the same thing with the GMPPNP form. Uh, so this is the active form. And again, we saw this major cluster, uh, we call it orientation A1. And this again was also unable to bind to its effectors. When we put the effector proteins in, the nanodisc will get in, in the way. But then we could see that these other orientations, calling them A, A2, 3, and 4, were capable of binding effectors. They were not, uh, they were obviously uh, not as well populated as A1. So what we could do then is we could say, well, orientation A2, it combined to this extended RLIP uh, structure that we solved um, a bit uh, quite a while ago already um, in one conformation. And then orientation A3 can also bind it. And we know another G protein binds over here, which is also membrane attached. So this one would be competent to bind both. Um, and there's this orientation A4 combined to the exorcist, which is this enormous, enormous octameric complex. And that's the only one that really had enough space to be able to bind to the, um, to bind to the exorcist. Okay, so we have this idea then, we have these different orientations. Um, we're assuming um, that the populations of these orientations are gonna be modulated by the lipid composition of the membrane. And we already had a few hints about this. But the other thing that we thought might be actually changing 
the way that these, this protein interacts with the membrane is just phosphorylation, because we know that there's a phosphorylation site in this region that binds to the membrane. So what we did was we used a phosphomimic. Um, so this phosphomimic S194D is known to work as a good phosphomimic in vivo, so it seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Um, so we uh, then we used um, PREs, so you put the spin label, this gadolinium spin label, into the, um, into the nanodisc, so there's around four per nanodisc. You don't know where it is, of course. And then we just looked, uh, and this is just to show you what the spectra looked like, and then we just looked to see uh, what was getting closer to the membrane, uh, but in when we compared the wild type and the phosphomimic mutant. So we're still kind of uh, doing the analysis on this data, which is why the error bars are so big. But basically what we can see at least is the S194D mutant is, is indeed pushed further away from the membrane. So the intensity, uh, it's not affected so much by the presence of the spin label. So it seems that this uh, phosphorylation is gonna be changing the orientation of this protein with respect to the membrane. Okay, so the other thing that this C-terminus of this protein does is it binds to calmodulin. So the first thing we did was we just took full length Raleigh and we did a titration with unlabeled calmodulin. Um, and you can see very clearly that not much changes, but a few things do. And when we map this onto our Raleigh structure, we can see that all of the changes are in the C-terminus of the protein. So around this hypervariable region. And in fact, the HBR itself, these residues here, they shift so far we can't track them. And this is just the C-terminal cysteine here. <coughs> okay, so we, so we have this idea then that the C-terminus of this protein is, is indeed binding to calmodulin, but we know that it's lipid modified. So what we've done so far was to always work with this PEMCC. So this is PEMCC here, which is a kind of double pronged lipid, which helps, helps it to bind really well into the nanodisks. But this is what the real thing looks like. This is geronal geronal. And of course it looks nothing like PEMCC. What we wanted to do was to be able to make RAL in a way that was more soluble and we were able to work with the lipid, lipid modified material. So one e expensive way to do this is to go into baculovirus and produce it there where it's properly modified, but we couldn't afford that. So what we did was we found this paper uh, which I referenced here, which was on snares, where they actually made a malayamide modified geronyl geronyl. So this is something you can buy from Sigma, so geronyl geronyl. Um, and then it's just an ester reaction where we have this really, um, uh, you, it's really very simple, chem chemically rather simple reaction. It's just done at room temperature with the right catalysts. And what you do then is you generate um, this uh, malayamide geronyl geronyl. So if we just compare how this looks then compared to the native uh, geronyl geronyl, so this is geronyl geronyl here. Um, this is our malayamide modified one. You can see it's a little bit bigger. And the other thing that we made was the Farnesyl version. So this is a carbon 15 rather than carbon 20. Uh, so we made the, the Farnesyl version as well because that was really using the same chemistry. And this is a bit smaller, so it's still lipid modified, but it means that we, it's actually a soluble protein so we can work with it. So then the next thing we did was to take this um, modified protein. Uh, we can put it onto nanodisks. So this is our, um, just to point out that I'm um, gonna call this MGG because it's easier than saying all of this. Sorry, I'm gonna call this MGG and this MFN. So we took, we could put it onto nanodisks. So we put our Raleigh onto nanodisks uh, using MGG, uh, titrated in calmodulin, and we could see that it binds. It doesn't look that tight. Um, which was surprising given that everything was in slow exchange when we did the NMR. Um, but we, uh, so this didn't bind particularly tightly. We also could see that when we bound it with this double pronged lipid, this PEMCC, it doesn't seem to bind. And we assume it's because it can't pull it out of the nanodisc. Um, we were interested in knowing whether it was nucleotide dependent. So we also tested uh, to see whether it bound the GDP bound form of the protein, and it does, so it looks pretty much the same. And then we were also interested in this phosphomimic mutant. So we made the phosphomimic mutant, and that also binds with more or less the same affinity. It has slightly different thermodynamics, but the affinity is the same. Okay, so um, we were kind of surprised by this relatively low affinity, 
So what we did then was to go on and do some biocore experiments. So uh, we wanted to really know the difference in binding between the mod lipid modified and unmodified RAL. So how here we oriented calmodulin on the chip and then flowed over modified or uh, unmodified RAL, so prenylated or unmodified RAL. And what you can see to cut a long story short is that when it's prenylated, it binds with an affinity of 23 nanomolar. And when it's uh, unmodified, it binds around tenfold weaker than that. Okay, so then we moved on to looking on the calmodulin side. So this is the titration of the protein modified and unmodified into calmodulin. And what you can see is immediately, of course, is that the unmodified protein causes relatively small shifts and the modified protein causes much larger shifts. And if we map these onto the calmodulin structure, then we can see that in the unmodified protein, we get all of the changes occurring in the C lobe of calmodulin. But when we use the modified protein, we then see changes all the way through the calmodulin, including the central linker. So if anyone doesn't know about calmodulin, it has uh, these two lobes, the N lobe and the C lobe. And then we have a link, a helical linker in between the two of them. And when it binds tightly to peptides, it often reorients the two lobes so that, um, uh, so that we melt this central helix. And what we can see is that both the uh, HVR and the lipid modification are required for this to happen. So knowing that it was not the whole RAL protein, it was only this HVR lipid modified at the C-terminus that was really necessary for binding, we then just bought a peptide, of course, and we could see that re 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 capitulated the binding really very well. So this is just the peptide and this is the full length protein. And basically the chemical shift looks, mapping looks exactly the same. So we started to work with the peptide. Uh, we crystallized it. Uh, the, we got a crystal structure. The structure only had calmodulin and we couldn't see the peptide. So we obviously then decided to solve the NMR structure. Uh, when we started to work with this, we were just using synthetic unlabeled peptide and what we found was um, that when we did the doubly rejected experiments, the, um, the, amide, uh, the amide peaks from the peptide were really so very broadened, we just couldn't really assign anything. So in the end, we realized we were gonna have to label the peptide as well. We couldn't afford to buy this thing uh, synthetically. So we actually made it biosynthetically. And I'm just gonna tell you how we did it because if anyone works on peptides, they might find this technique quite useful. So what we used was an expression construct of PET31B. And PET31B is a commercial vector. So you get your protein expressed with um, KSI, so keto something isomerase. <laughs> um, and this is insoluble. So it takes your protein into inclusion bodies where it can't get chewed up. And the original vector, you have methionines between your peptide of interest, and you can have many copies of it. Um, and then you have to cleave that with cyanogen bromide, which nobody wants to do because it's a horrible toxic chemical. What we realized we could do was if we have a, um, an aspartate and a proline, if you put that at low pH, the DP bond gets broken. And so you can actually just do this in a relatively straightforward way by just dropping the pH to about two. And this works really well to express peptides. So we made like half a liter and we got enough peptide for loads and loads of experiments. The only problem is, uh, just a word of caution, if you have an asparagine in there, then this shuffles around and can form an isopeptide bond. So if you've got one of those in the middle of your sequence of interest, it's not so useful. Ours was on one end, so it wasn't such a problem. Okay, so we use this then to solve our structure. So this is the structure of calmodulin with the um, HVR peptide, uh, funacylated RAL. And on the right here, I've just shown you uh, the carbon nosy and the um, X-filtered experiment that we recorded uh, with our labeled peptide with just a particular hydrophobic amino acid. And what you can see immediately when you look at this is the two lobes are really not oriented with respect to each other. So we can align on the N lobe and we can see the Farnesyl interacting, or we can align on the C lobe and we can see the HBR protein part interacting, but we can't align over the whole thing. So if we just look at one snapshot just to help us see what's going on. So this is the N lobe binding to the Farnesyl, which is exactly what we had predicted would happen. And then we can see the C lobe, we have this kind of um, relatively flexible region in the middle. And then we have a single alpha helix, a uh, single turn of alpha helix in the, in the peptide binding to the C lobe. 
And when we look at how the Fana cell binds, we can see it binding into this very hydrophobic pocket. We can see all the amino acid side chains and kind of lining that pocket in the end lobe of cow modulin. And then when we look at the C lobe, we can see really the, the, the driving force for most of the interactions here are these two hydrophobic residues, so isoleucine 199 and leucine 195, which form an extensive array of um, hydrophobic interactions with the C lobe. Okay, so we'd worked out now then that this pharmacyl group, which is sticking this protein into the membrane, is actually binding to calmodulin and is, and is kind of really ha helped into a hydrophobic pocket in calmodulin. So we asked then, does that mean that calmodulin could take this protein off a membrane? Uh, and so what we did was this really very simple experiment where we used the fact that nanodisks have a his tag on the scaffold protein. So you can just pull them down on nickel beads. And we, so we call this our pull down pull off experiment. So here we can see then that when we pull down on the nickel beads, this is the scaffold protein from the nanodisks and this is RAL. So this is just a block because they're the same size. When you wash in calmodulin, you can see um, that the RAL protein is coming off. So it's pulling it off. And then when you wash in buffer, it doesn't. So indeed it does pull it off the membrane. Uh, we did a similar experiment by Biocore as well. So we did, we put um, liposomes on the chip um, and then you loaded the chip up with Raleigh. And when you wash calmodulin in uh, to the wild type Raleigh, you can see that it's coming off. And if you use buffer, it doesn't. Um, uh, sorry, if you use buffer, it, it, it stops coming off. And then um, we use this double mutant. So we took those two hydrophobic residues in the HVR and then it doesn't come off anymore. So that kind of led, led us to this idea of this model of what's going on at the membrane. So we have calmodulin coming along, interacting first of all with these, um, these hydrophobic residues, we call them anchorite one. So it's kind of pulling them off. And then we start to get some competition for this basic motif with the negative residues in the linker of calmodulin, and then it kind of pulls the rest of the protein out of the membrane. So the prenyl anchor then gets pulled out and sequestered into calmodulin. So uh, what, can, what is actually um, regulating this process then? So we think what might be regulating this process is actually the phosphorylation of this serine. So we already found that phosphorylation of this serine allows the protein to come away from the membrane a bit more, but it doesn't stop it binding to calmodulin. Okay, so uh, this is the last, this is December 2019, <laughs> when we were actually allowed to have parties. This is our last lab party. Uh, so this is Sam, uh, who did most of this work. He has just, uh, just left the lab and gone off to Oxford to learn to do cryo EM. Um, and this is Darica, who I run my lab with. Um, this work was all done uh, in a studentship that Sam had with AstraZeneca and BBSRC. So we had a lot of help from, um, Andrea Golke, so she is a, the Biocore expert um, and his other supervisor at AZ. And of course, Daniel, who um, helps us uh, with all of our NMR facility experiments and Catherine, who runs our biophysics facility in Cambridge. And thank you. So I'll take any questions. Thank you, Helen. Uh, so uh, we already have two questions in the Q&A. Uh, the first one is by Tarin Blumenschein. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, Helen. Good to see you even <laughs> online. I guess that you can all sign. Um, very cool expression system for the peptide. What would you say is the size limit for peptides expressed in that way? I don't know that there is a size limit because you can... Um, so we made it, we made the... Um, the prime, we made it by nesting primers. So it was not done by cloning. So I guess it could be limited by that. And uh, I we've done peptides into the whole, oh, actually, I think we might even have done in well into the about 30 residues or something. So I think as long as you don't mind it being unfolded, I can't imagine there will be a size limit. Okay, thank Which you. My guess, yeah. Uh, uh, Kevin Gardner uh, uh, says, hi, Helen. Uh, quick question on RAL A nanodisc headocking. While I can imagine why there might be preferential tilt angle, it looked uh, the, like there were slightly preferential rotation angles to given what I would have thought would be a homogeneous lipid environment around RAL A. <laughs> if this preference holds, and if so, what might be causing it? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it could be uh, that you're going to get some lipid clustering um, so that you would, because I think that would definitely give you preferential uh, angles. I mean, we have only literally just done the haddock docking once or twice, so we haven't really done it rigorously. I think what we need to do is to go into, you know, very long simulations. So in the RAS field, people are just doing massive simulations now instead and looking at what comes out of that rather than doing haddock, which is really very short, a really very short time scale uh, MD step. Thank you. Uh, David Eliza, great talk. Two questions. Did you have to label the pharmaceutical group for structure determination? Uh, and second, if you perturb, uh, no, I guess perturb the pharmaceutical binding site in the internal lobe, do you still displace RAL from the membrane? Okay, so the first question, no, we didn't label it, uh, but we did run spectra on the free pharmaceutical and assign it and use that to help us uh, because it was basically relied on doubly rejected experiments, which are always quite ugly. Um, we have never done any mutations in the end lobe, so we don't know about whether that would stop it from working. I think our ideas now were to go and try to do that, test it obviously in vitro, and then set some cell experiments up to see with our collaborators to see whether or not it would work. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so then I guess uh, an insider question from Rolf Berlins regarding Haddock. <laughs> uh, on the fixed orientations of the Haddock membrane complex as well, when RAL A binds to the nano disks, what is the estimated overall line width uh, from intensity drop? <laughs> what does you expect for the size of a two to one complex? It's a good question because obviously we never really had a two to one complex. And the other thing was that we always assumed we only had one RAL per, per face of the disc because we thought there probably wasn't enough space to have any more. Um, given that we were using the smallest nano discs, we could, well, the MSP1D1, so I think about mm. 10 nanometers. Um, so we, but basically we just using normal trozy, no deuteration, we could pretty much see everything apart from the very weak peaks. So I can't tell you an exact line width change, but it really didn't look as bad mm. as something. I just think, because I think it's flopping around on the, basically on the disc, so that it's not attached strongly enough to be able, and you can see that from the chemical shifts as well, but it's not attached strongly enough to really get very broad. Mm. I myself actually was also wondering, I mean, how you can imagine that you have only one RAL per site being bound, right? I mean, because yeah. of the edges. I, and, yeah, I think there wouldn't be enough space. I think obviously we were considering using other, you know, bigger ones to see if we could get, there's a lot of work on in the RAS field about clustering that they think RAS is forming dimers. so whether or not we could try to be under conditions where we could get two per face and then, but then we might just end up with no, <laughs> no signal anymore. <laughs> it's always the way. If I could ask a follow-up question, it looked in some of the pictures like RAL was interacting with the edge of the nano disc. Is that yeah, I think they're a bit more stylized than that, but yeah, I, we don't know, do we? Because we, we don't know what, whether what we're seeing is interactions with even the belt protein or falling off the edge of the disc. This is the problem with nano discs, isn't it? That, that you don't really quite know where anything is and things move around. So then from, uh, from Haddock to a Calmodulin expert, so Mitsui Kura, I uh, would like <laughs> to just congratulate to you, you to the talk and then uh, is the uh, binding to RAL A Calmodulin calcium dependent? And does your binding data show a one-to-one -one complexation? Um, yes, it is calcium dependent. Um, and yes, we're pretty sure it's one-to-one -one, uh, from the titrations as, as well as everything else. And the, uh, the ITC is obviously the experiment you would do to work that out. But we, this was always with the nanodisc bound protein. And there it's really difficult to work out the actual concentration. Of rally that you've got there, but we, we think it is one to one. Okay. Thank you. So, one last question from Walter Chessin. Uh, the calmodulum spectrum looks like the calmodulum, calcium loaded state. It is, uh, yeah. Is yeah. binding calcium dependent? Okay, so then yeah. question calmodulum regulation therefore means it's responsive to calcium signals. What does that mean biologically? 
Yeah, there's a question. So we, I mean, um, we assume that means that there's a confluence of signals where you get, so our model would be you, you're going to get, um, cal, you know, increased calcium, which gives you the active cal modulin, and then also increased phosphorylation of RAL coming together to allow you to activate the RAL and then it can move. And, and then RAL, it's believed to ends up um, at mitochondria. Um, so uh, the idea is we think maybe it's shuffling down to the mitochondria. And then if the calcium level is lower there, then the calmodulin would drop it and be able to deposit it there. That's a, a lot of difficult biology to be able to work out. <laughs> Certainly not experiments I would be able to do. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Helen, again, for a fantastic presentation and thank exciting you. discussion. So then we move on to our second speaker of today, which is Burkhard Louis from uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and will be introduced by either Stefan or Christian, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I, I think I will step not around, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know, maybe he did not make it to the panel. So. Uh, I, am, I have the honor to introduce Burkhardt. Uh, he's our director of the Institute for Biological Surfaces uh, at the KIT, not to mix up with MIT, although of course the KIT would like to be mixed up with the MIT. Uh, so he got his education uh, um, at the University of Frankfurt, uh, studied physics there, um, uh, but also uh, economy, which actually I did not know <laughs> before. And I should know because uh, he did his PhD then together with um, Stefan Glaser and myself. So he was kind of co-supervised. Uh, then he moved on for um, a postdoc position with uh, John Marino um, at the um, NIST, where he still is. Uh, okay, so he is a Center of Advanced Research in Biotechnology. But I think at the time he was already at the NIST. Um, and then uh, he went uh, back to, uh, to, to Germany and um, uh, made his way up uh, all third party finance, first with a uh, Justus von Liebig fellowship, then with an Emmy Noether program funded by the uh, DFG, by the Science Foundation in, in Germany. Uh, then he was a um, 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 Habilitant uh, and a Heisenberg, funded by Heisenberg. Uh, again from the DFG, and uh, then uh, got a position um, at the KIT, where he moved also up the ranks to co-director, um, and now also director, the last position that I was um, mentioning. So um, he is probably one of the first examples of an alternative career path in, in Germany, which uh, was kind of the old style was that one was working under a professor, but the new style was that independence was very early on and he used it actually. Um, he's well known for pulse sequence development, especially also then in the field of optimal control. Uh, the other thing is anisotropic uh, parameters, mainly for small molecules. Um, and probably his most famous sequence is maybe the simplest, but as always, it's the clip HSQC, which one can use very well in order to, to determine uh, coupling constants, um, uh, um, which, which of course is in the combination of uh, anisotropic uh, alignment, means then that one can determine um, uh, um, anisotropic parameters, i.e. I uh, residual dipolar couplings. Okay, Burkhardt, the floor is, floor is yours, and um, please, the audience, enjoy the talk. So maybe I should switch on my microphone. So. Um... Thanks a lot, Christian, for this uh, quite long introduction. I don't know if I de deserve this, but uh, yeah. Um, well, I hope you can see the slide now. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, well, today I would like to talk about new developments or developments of the last uh, two years that could be of interest for biologically interested uh, magnetic resonant people. And um, so I would, I, I have here three parts with technical developments that I guess might be useful. And um, yeah, I would like to start with the so-called Shaka HSQC, 
which is an H alpha detection for intrinsically disordered proteins. And I think this is really worth uh, noting if you are dealing with um, IDPs in, in any way. So how do you detect usually IDPs? So you have the HN detection, the conventional detection for proteins, but there you have the problem that, well, the amide protons, they do exchange, exchange with the solvent. They are not any longer really fixed in hydrogen bonding. So exchange is a big problem here. Then um, oh, maybe I should switch on the pointer. Maybe, then you also have H alpha detection, which would be as nice as, as amide protection, uh, detection because you get the nice signal to noise. But um, what you end up are very broad lines and the resolution is quite miserable if you use conventional um, H alpha detected methods. So another or the state of the art technique right now, I would say is carbonyl detection. And here you have fantastic um, resolution, but what you have also is relatively low sensitivity. And in some circumstances, this can be, well, not the way you would like to have it. So we, we had a look into this and what we found out actually was that the H alpha C alpha correlations in proteins, the line width is not due to relaxation or anything there, but it's due to the huge amount of coptic constants that you have. I mean, you can see it here, the H alpha has many, many couplings here to the side chain, to 15N, to the proton, to the carbonyl, et cetera, et cetera. And the carbon, the C alpha as well, even worse. It's a huge multiplet that you have on the carbonyl. And that of course limits your, well, resolution in the end. So, we had to look into it and we came up with a sequence shown here, the so-called selective H alpha C alpha HSQC or Shaka HSQC. And we have essentially in the HSQC two elements, two unusual elements. One is um, a selective element in which we also encode here the, the echo anti-echo. And that is, is really very nice for, for carbons everything besides the C alpha C alpha couplings, and like three J C alpha C alpha couplings to the next residues, everything else is, is decoupled here. And then we also introduce here this so-called base rex homonuclear decoupling. And this base rex homonuclear decoupling is, is, is expanded here. This is essentially a chunked homo decoupling sequence where we then have an, um, a BERT filter in here but it's not a conventional bird filter, but a filter with a selective pulse on carbon. And with carbon, you have broad ranges. That means you have relatively short pulses here and you can nicely selectively, um, well, have the, the bird to the assay alphas and you decouple everything that uh, concerns other carbons. And so this element is quite nice and gives you nice resolution as you will see in a moment. I mean, one of the nicest examples we, uh, we saw right away was, was uh, here on this P53 IDP, just the proline region is shown. And when you look at the conventional constant time HSQC, you see it here in the left upper corner. And essentially you are limited because of all these small couplings that you have in carbon dimension. You, you cannot um, actually extend this constant time period very much. So this is about the resolution you, you have to end up with. It doesn't get any better. However, if you take this C alpha selective decoupled HSQC, you see it gets much nicer. And um, when you take the C alpha and the HN decoupling in the indirect dimension, it gets even nicer. And then if you use the base rex homonuclear decoupling in the end, you have a resolution that's really fantastic. The, the width in, in both dimensions is, is on the order of six to eight Hertz. So it's really very nice narrow lines. And um, yeah, just to show you here, actually a surprising result for me is even, I mean, we do some pre-saturation in the beginning and even where we pre-saturate, we see signals very close to it, 
and a really nice signal to noise. And we were puzzled a bit by it because um, you would think that you, um, you destroy it, you pre-saturate them, you saturate them. But um, it turns out that most likely because we, we are touching the H alphas, what we actually do is we do heteronuclear NOE built up on the carbon magnetization. And we make sure that we also use the carbon magnetization. And so we end up with cross peaks that are only marginally smaller in, in its sensitivity than the other cross peaks. So it's really nice here. And here's just another example that shows you what you can do. This is 200 micromolar alpha synuclein in 90% water sample. And you can see here this region expanded here, the alanines or, or here the valines. Uh, you see almost all signals resolved. It's really nice. I mean, very, very similar to um, conventional amide detection. And actually, when you look at the dispersion, you see that um, the Shark HSQC has a similar dispersion here to the CON, uh, the CON experiments, and has a far better, actually, resolution compared to the Proton 15N HSQC if you count for the different the line width that we observe and the spectral region you have. And of course, this is now just the starting point because this kind of detection, you can kind of build up, build in now in every, in any um, 3D experiment you can think of. And here's a, a first example where we basically use the Shaka uh, building block here in the end of a 3D experiment that's optimized to detect proline, HCGCB, CAHA experiment. An experiment where in the uh, first dimension, you have the C gamma C betas here shown. And uh, in the other dimension, these are alpha H alpha, you have the resolution we were just talking about. This is shown here in the plane. And so here's a very nice example from, from Fanny Shabak. And um, she has here many different prolines. And um, in this P53, there are also minor uh, conformers. And here you can see nicely these small little peaks of the minor conformers. And what you see here is actually these, uh, the C betas and the C gamma chemical shifts of such um, yeah, uh, prolines. And you can nicely see that the cis trans isomers, I mean, are changing also in, in unusual positions. And this is like up to about 50 micromolar um, concentrations we see here in an overnight experiment and well you can nicely now see this with a sensitivity and resolution with other experiments I don't see how you would be able to do this well so I would like to, to give you some overview of of new pulses that we developed it might be of interest and the first one would be for 19F bandwidth for, for ligands screening, for example, for pharmaceutical applications more. And usually you have a, a, a nice mixture of, of, um, yeah, of fluorinated compounds. And when you really want to do screening, then on a 600 megahertz spectrometer, you have 112 kilohertz to cover. And that's difficult to do. With hard pulses, you have no choice but to acquire four different experiments here in, in a row. And when you use adiabatic pulses, you still cannot cover the full range. You, you uh, need to divide it into uh, two regions, essentially, if you use at least conventional adiabatic pulses. So we looked into this and we optimized pulses here. We call them 19F Burbo pulses, the 90 degree and 180 degree pulses. These are universal rotation pulses. That means they, they perform really rotations like a, like a hard pulse on resonant. And um, so our 90 degree pulse is 600 microseconds and 180 only one microsecond long. And they both cover 120 kilohertz. So they are nicely suitable for doing such kinds of experiments like, like the CPMG experiments that you would like to do for ligand screening. And just to show you here, it's really the case here. You have this 112 kilohertz covered 
with all the compounds. And um, that's done with these uh, 90 and 180 degree 19F Burbock pulses. And now you can do these experiments in one go. You can also, of course, use it in all kinds of 2D experiments. If you want to do fluin fluin nosy or, or even uh, toxy type experiments, you can use such pulses um, as we are working on right now. And this is really a, um, a very interesting uh, development, I think, because these pulses are very short much shorter than any other pulse that has been uh, published that can cover this bandwidth. Then I would like to introduce here a um, completely new class of, of uh, universal rotation pulses, the so-called SORDO pulses that have been developed by David Goodwin. And what we have here is, <clears throat> these are pulses that show universal rotation over the full bandwidth, that means it's a 90 degree pulse around a certain angle in all cases, for example, uh, but it has a quadratic phase dependence. That means on res resonant, it may be an X pulse, but when you move along the offset, the rotation might be around different um, phases. I mean, and when you do just, when you um, do an offset profile here, of an uncompensated pulse here, the SORDO 90 pulse. You see, this looks very strange, but this is this quadratic phase behavior. And when you then do a second order phase correction, then you see that the spectrum is nicely phaseable and it has a relatively uniform um, excitation profile here, as you would like to have. And <clears throat> we did here a 90 and 180 degree pulse that match the phase. And then you can do really 2D experiments. And um, the interesting thing to note is these pulses have a chirp-like pulse phase, like you see this quadratic phase behavior, but what you have are, are jumps in between, uh, like very defined uh, switching of, um, of amplitude and phase here. And why are we so much interested in this? What you see in this slide here is um, essentially, here are shown the, the best broadband pulses available so far. And here you see the performance of the SORDO pulses with the same quality factor, just with this quadratic phase. And what you see is that these pulses are essentially half as long as the conventional universal rotation pulses. So you, you save 50% of your RF energy and that, of course, might be of uh, quite some interest when you look at uh, well, all different kinds of applications. So whenever RF energy is a problem, you may think of these pulses. With this, I would like to just say um, something about a third class of, of pulses. And uh, that's a problem, actually, um, Brooker made us aware, and that is that uh, for standard conventional um, triple resonance experiments, you need um, um, selective 90 and 180 degree pulses. And right now you would use a Q5 or a Q3 pulse, for example. But when you look at them, they have an RF amplitude that is very high, especially in the aliphatic region. And so when you apply them at 1.2 gigahertz, you would need an a maximum RF amplitude of 25 or even 30 kilohertz to cover the bandwidth that you need. And that's simply not available. So we kind of started here, um, first optimizations. And what I show you here are preliminary results, but we get selective pulses here that do not look at all like selective pulses that you usually know. They almost have constant amplitude and everything is done in the phase behavior. But what you see here to the right is uh, you get nice offset profiles that are actually even better than the Q5 and Q3 offset profiles and uh, very well, very nice performance. And that with a maximum RF amplitude of only 15 kilohertz. So I guess with such kind of pulses, you will be able to do triple resonance experiments in the future also on the very large high field spectrometers. And I should say that these results are preliminary. They are not yet tested experimentally. So one should take them with a bit of care. Well, 
the last part of the talk, I would like to more introduce a concept um, and that has to do with residual Doppler couplings. I hope you are all familiar with residual Doppler couplings. Essentially, you kind of, you, you, you somehow align a sample here, for example, by stretching it in a gel. You measure isotropic and anisotropic couplings. And then you can use it for constitutional analysis if you have a chiral gel for enantiomeric excess for configurational analysis and especially also for confirmation. And here you see this um, well-known example here of an RNA that you suddenly make a really nice looking. Well, what you usually do when you look at you know, residual Doppler couplings and you want to interpret the data, you are looking into the so-called molecular frame of reference and you're trying to get the alignment tensor of this molecule and then you, um, well, you live with it and you, you uh, kind of uh, determine, well, the configuration or whatever you would like to have or confirmation. Well, but somehow this is only valid for a rigid entity. Like if you have a completely rigid molecule, it's nice. Or if you have a part of the molecule that's rigid, it's nice. But in principle, you cannot say anything uh, about the molecule uh, that is flexible in the beginning. The only thing that you can actually do is you can look at the interaction itself. That means your smallest rigid identity uh, entity is usually the CH coupling, for example, that you have. And I guess we can assume that the CH distance is pretty much constant. And so we have a rigid system here. And with another third, um, atom in this molecule as a reference, we can define here an interaction frame actually of this uh, coupling. And when we have that, then we can go here into this uh, interaction frame. And then the dipolar interaction at time point zero is the alpha beta uh, zero. This is then averaged over time. And this can be shown here. It, it's uh, averaged you can write it down with the um, rotational matrices here that would transform the original dipolar uh, tensor into, well, the tensor that it has uh, at every point in time. So with this integral, you can integrate this. And when you do this, what you end up is essentially this formula here, where this A gamma delta is the alignment tensor A, and that is what you can get. But be aware, this is the alignment tensor of just this uh, interaction in this interaction frame. So if you have 20 RDCs measured, then you get 20 interaction frames. But with these transformational matrices, you can describe here everything. What happens now when we go into the laboratory frame? Well, in the laboratory frame, the magnetic field is fixed and the molecule is moving. But we can write down a very similar averaging. Again, we have our initial dipolar coupling tensor and we can describe the averaging over such um, rotational matrices, they are called T here. So formula look very, very similar. And especially when you look at how these uh, um, uh, matrices are related, and then you see that these T matrices here are just the inverse of the, the rotational matrices we had in the uh, um, interaction frame, which means it's also, it's simply the transposed. But because they're averaged, the, the averaging is, is, is very different in the end, although it's just, um, yeah, the inverse. And when we do so, then we have to realize that because we are in the lab frame, the magnetic field has cylindrical symmetry. And we also know that the dipolar interaction um, must vanish. That means uh, when you go far away, that means we, have a, we must have a vanishing trace. And then it automatically follows in this case that we have to have this type of, dipolar, of average dipolar interaction in the laboratory frame. And you all know this as the secular dipolar Hamiltonian or dipolar constants here in the Hamiltonian. 
But you see, we have only one constant D that is changed and the rest can be determined. And why is this so nice? This is nice because we can measure one average coupling. And that's for example, here, this experimental coupling. And then we can construct a full um, tensor out of this. And this tensor can be our target now in, for example, a molecular dynamic simulation. So we can define here a pseudo energy shown like that, where, where all the, the components of this tensorial constraint um, have to be fulfilled. And so this actually, because it's happening here in the laboratory frame, then induces rotations in the molecular dynamic simulations simply to fulfill these tensorial constraints. And why is this so nice? Well, what you end up with this when you do it, you do not only get a conventional structural ensemble that you um, have typically in, uh, well, in a conventional MD simulation without these tensorial constraints, but what you get is this, what is shown here on the left-hand side, you get a structural and orientational ensemble. And that consists of course of, of th thousands of structures that you need to, to really cover the space here, the, the different orientations. But here in this, on the left-hand side is really all the information of the alignment in it. And so as we have this information now from an MD simulation, what we can then do is, well, we have here this laboratory frame, averaged couplings with these uh, rotational matrices. And at every time point, we simply can take these, uh, these rotational matrices and produce the uh, rotational matrices from the molecular frame and then do the time averaging simply because of this relation. And then we get individually averaged dipolar couplings and individual alignment tensors in the molecular frame. I just want to show you here how this looks like. We have here a very nice small molecule, norcamphor, and this is considered quite rigid. And on the right-hand side, you see here um, the, well, the average dipolar, um, yeah, dipolar coupling uh, tensors here for the different protons involved in the CH couplings. And what you see, I mean, uh, we, I did not use all the, uh, uh, the couplings for averaging. So what you see, what you should see here is a, is a perfectly uh, symmetric, nice uh, cylindrical uh, um, tensor. And what you see is that they differ very much in size and even in sign. I mean, also these are averaged couplings, but they all point in the same direction, which is the Z axis of the alignment. And you, you have that here. But when you go here into molecular frame, with the individual alignment tensors. You see here on the left that the tensors at first glance are pretty much the same, but you also see that they differ a little bit in size. That's what you typically see is that the alignment tensor, um, you have some flexibility and that's why the averaging here for the different couplings is slightly different. That's why you still have, when you hit with a single alignment tensor, some error here. But this is a rigid molecule. How does it look with a different molecule? And a nice example here is this alpha cellulose. It's a disaccharide. And here you see um, it has some flexibility here around the glycosidic bond. And well, on the right hand side again, you see the laboratory frame, what we saw beforehand. And to the left, it's very interesting to see the alignment tensors of the individual interactions. And you clearly see that they are very different for the two parts of the molecule here. And so in this case, you cannot fit them to a single alignment tensor anymore, that's clear. And I would say that you have a very good chance to fit it with two alignment tensors on the left-hand side. But how is it with a really more flexible molecule? And here's this molecule, oidiolactone B, and this has quite some flexibility here in the, the A ring, C ring, and also here in the B ring a bit. And what you see here is you have many, many very different alignment tensors at the individual sides. And in this case, you really cannot fit a single alignment tensor. Even when you look at it, if you would do a multiple tensor, align, I mean, alignment tensor fit, then 
you would have to introduce something like six or eight different tensors uh, to, to fit these data. And that shows you what complexity, what you can learn with such an MDoc approach um, that you uh, use the way that I just introduced. And with this, I just want to finish by thanking the people involved. And uh, in the Shaka uh, project, I want to point out that Andrea Bodor, she, she did really, she pushed, pushed this project, she initiated it, she did all, all the things here. Uh, and uh, Fanny Shebak, she, um, She's really doing uh, now these 3D experiments and is involved in it and they're a great team and uh, it's really fun to work with them. Also uh, involved is, is uh, Wolfgang Bermel, uh, alias uh, um, uh, James, um, James, uh, how is it called, Freshville. Um, I think he's, uh, uh, he's looking nice there. And uh, of course, uh, that was Fosfar, Xavier Payer was involved with by, by providing um, uh, proteins as well as Laszlo Nitra and um, yeah, uh, with, um, who also provided uh, some of the molecules. And from our group, it's Jens Haller who, who did the work here. Then the 19F Burbop was a collaboration with, uh, in, yeah, with the Novartis, with uh, Andreas Linge, then Andreas Bozo Frank. And, and also Alva Gossard, who was still at the time at, uh, at Novartis and, and uh, also in, in Zurich later on, and with Tony Reinsberg from our group, and also involved were, were all these people here um, who uh, were involved in the libraries involved. Then the solder pulses were done, developed, idea, everything by, by David Goodwin. And uh, he uh, collaborated strongly with Martin, also from our group, uh, here, both in our group. And uh, yeah, David is now in Oxford and Martin in, in, uh, in the US. And uh, the server pulse is now for the uh, selective um, excitation and inversion pulses or uh, nine, universal 90 and 180 degrees have been optimized by Stella Slut. And it's in collaboration with Wolfgang Berne. And the MDoc story. Herr uh, Ulrich Sternberg is the one who invented this, the MDoc constraints and who, of course, pushed this project. Without him, nothing would have happened. And um, Pavletta, Emine, Marika, Thomas, um, and Armando, uh, they all have been involved in, in, at very different stages here uh, of this project. And, um, well, that leaves me nothing but thank you for your attention and I hope that something was there that might be useful also for you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bulu. And um, uh, uh, I start with the questions. Um, so Clemens Anklin is asking, very nice talk. How large is the quadratic phase correction for the Sordor pulses? Can it be calculated from the pulse? And Ilya continues with uh, the same question with the pulses. Why stop at quadratic phase? You could generate a very short pulse to get the magnetization into the transverse plane in unspecified phase and then get the required phase correction transformation from a simulation. So the, the question is regarding the phase correction of the solar pulses. Well, um, don't ask me the exact amount. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, um, I don't remember at the moment. Um, the phase correction can be calculated. So um, we uh, always estimated it. And uh, when we had this data, um, we, we uh, I mean, we wrote a routine ourselves that uh, you have to put in the value and then calculate the second order phase correction. And it took us two tries. And then we always had a, a nice phase correction. So that was well, relatively straightforward and easy. Um, and why not uh, using... Uh, um, Higher order phase uh, correction? Um, yes, actually, uh, we are working on this, but at least for the 180 degree pulses, I don't think it makes too much sense um, because the 180 degree pulses, we have half the duration. And that is the duration of inversion pulses. That means point to point 180 degree pulses. And I don't think we will get shorter than this because they do not have any phase restraints. And uh, 
we already reached that with the with his quadratic pulses. So I do not see that we will get further improvement by loosening the phase um, constraints. But in principle, yes, we are looking into this also because we want to have matched pairs and for the 90 degree pulses, we do not know where the limit is. So we're looking into this. Christian, can I ask a follow-up? Yeah, of when you When you apply quadratic phase on broad lines, do you see any distortions of the base plane? Um, that should be the case. I think so, yes. But uh, the, the phase change is not so big. Um, I mean, the problem is that on the edges, it's stronger than in the center. So if you have very broad lines at the edges, it might be that you get phase distortions. But um, I mean, these pulses have been, how can I say, uh, um, um, 50 kilohertz broad. And at the edges, you have, um, I mean, I think the phase deviation is something like uh, 6 pi or so in the, in the um, worst cases. And 6 pi, this is not that much. It means your lines should be broad like 500 hertz to have a significant um, a distortion there. But in principle, you're right. But if you have 500 hertz broad lines, then I think you have other problems, but uh, uh, not the, the, the bandwidth of the pulses. But yeah. Art, are you done? Yes. Um, then um, uh, seeing continuing on these pulses uh, from Wolfgang Bermel, hello, Bulu, nice talk on the quadratic phase. Can the quadratic phase be self-compensated by a 1980 sequence? Um, when you start with Z and then you do any kind of sequence and then you return your magnetization to Z, then it is compensated. These, uh, the, the pulses, we always have pulse pairs that have the same quadratic phase dependence for a 90 and 180 degree pulse. So really we, we, um, we already did um, uh, like uh, uh, toxic sequences, like planar mixing and toxic sequences um, with these pulses. And they work perfectly nice um, because we start and end up with a Z magnetization in this block. We uh, have um, perfect phase. There's no quadratic phase uh, correction needed in this case. Of course, if you start with Z and end up with in the XY plane, then you have at least one quadratic phase that you need to correct. Okay, now we have uh, two questions, uh, or actually three questions for the Shaka HSQC. Uh, there's one from Wolf uh, Bulls. Mm -hmm. uh, on your sequence, did you try Shaka HSQC on a 25 kilovolt protonated protein? And what are typical pulse lengths of Burbop uh, at radio frequency? Uh, notation frequency of 25 kilohertz. Okay, so these are two questions actually. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. The first one, the Shaka on the 25 yeah. kilodalton protein. So, so 25 kilodalton, we did not try it. And I'm not sure if it makes sense. Um, one should try, but um, I, um, first of all, when you have 25 kilodalton, then the line width um, due to relaxation will, uh, will dominate the line width, I mean, the, the, the couplings involved are, um, an, let's say, a minor extension to the line with, uh, typically. Especially the C alphas relax very fast on these large proteins, and um, the protons also have quite some significant line with uh, fast relaxation. So what we tried is we used ubiquitin, uh, as you know, is much smaller than 25 kilodalton, and there we um, we saw half the gain we saw with um, with <clears throat> with um, uh, the IDPs. So we still saw a gain with the Shaka HSQC over conventional constant time or whatever uh, HSQC experiment. But um, the gain was um, not that large anymore. And I guess there is a crossover when you go to, I have no clue, maybe 10, 15 kilodaltons in, in this range where you do not gain anymore and where conventional HSQC is, is simply better. 
because also with this base rex decoupling, of course you, ex you extend the length of your FID, which which means um, uh, during the uh, the bird type uh, parts you have relaxation taking place, and that makes your lines broader. And so it only makes sense when you have um, a protein with very narrow lines, which essentially means IDPs or very small um, glob um, yeah, globular pro proteins. There, there, were, there were questions in this direction also from uh, Phil Selenko, uh, the sensitivity comparison with the HXC, but you answered that now. Um, sensitivity problems also from Stefan Painter. He also asked, did you already test a carbon coupled chakra HSUC to look at conformations of peptides slash proteins? Carbon coupled. That carbon coupled probably to measure RDC, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, we did not try it, but um, uh, applying a doubly selective pulse or leaving out some uh, some uh, some region where you have couplings, for example, C alpha C O couplings, I think would would not at all be a problem. This could should be easily doable. That would be pretty much straightforward. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think it's a good idea to, to continue with. Thank you. Yeah. Good, then um, the last question, I think from the for the formal one, and then we go to the informal. We have actually two people that have raised their hand already, which I have kind of pushed away for the informal session uh, is from Christina Thiele, nice talk. I did not get why you should need more than three to four conformers slash tensors for the audio lactone, could you explain? And I guess this discussion will continue then in the informal. <laughs> what? Um, let me quickly uh, go back here. When you look here at the different alignment tensors, um, this one is different from this one, is for different from this one, is different from this one, is different from these ones, different from this one. Even if you, have, if you have a superposition of different alignment tensors for this molecule, you need six alignment tensors to describe this fully. I mean, I don't see how you can do it with two alignment tensors. You will have a, a huge error then. I mean, because of course, a single alignment tensor is always an approximation because there is no, no such thing as a rigid molecule. Even though comfort, you saw, shows some flexibility. But um, yeah, so here the approximation will be very rough if you use a single or just two or whatever alignment tensors. 